welcome. I'm Sarah Garvin Rogers. And you've had a long relationship with G4G. Uh, can you sort of trace that back to the very beginning? Because in 1993, this started, and it started with Tom Rogers, your husband. Uh, there must have been a prehistory to that. What, 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 what went before 1993 that led to him being instrumental in creating this? I've given thought to this because, of course, gathering for Gardner um, as the years went by was Tom's great passion. And I believe the um, thinking that went into it as Tom founded it, he was, of course, a great follower of Martin Gardner and, of course, had personally met him and spent time with him and knew Martin Gardner's interests. Um, and Tom was also an early attendee of the TED conference. He was also a participant in the earliest days of the International Puzzle Party. So I believe all of those elements came together and Tom conceived of a conference in which attendees came from all of the fields and interfaced with one another. So thus you had musicians, mathematicians, you had um, magicians, probably, very notably. Yes. And his idea was that you would bring people who in the beginning probably were all followers of Martin Gardner and you would get them all together mm -hmm and good things would happen. And as it turned out, that's precisely been the evolution of Gathering for Gardner. Well, I have to say he had great insight because you have to explain to people sometimes why Martin was successful, and it's because he did draw upon all of these elements. And so Tom obviously had a great insight that this is the way to success. Did he have already um, contacts in all of these communities or did he have to develop no, those? No, he started from scratch. He would call Elwin Berlinkamp, you know, the great math professors. He would just call them up and say, this is what I think we ought to do. Would you help? Right. And um, I think the, the special dimension of Gathering for Gardner that is Tom's unique contribution is he wanted it to be non-hierarchical. In other words, if there's going to be participation, everybody's at the same level and thus the exchange gift. Yes. I mean, you can be, you know, Nathan Mirenbold, you can be anybody, but you can also be a student in high school. Yes. <laughs> and you exchange gifts as peers. Um, so I think I think that was a special aspect that Tom went out of his way. No prizes, uh, no one gift is better than another gift, no attendee is of higher rank than another attendee. Yes. So since Tom attended many significant conferences, yes. this was his personal conclusion as to what he wanted to develop. Now, the International Puzzle Party had a tradition of gift exchanges, and so perhaps he, he got that from there. But it also had a, a tradition of exclusiveness uh, that, that G4G never had, and that's all, all good. But just one thing that has always um, I've wondered about is why did he make it invitation only? Well, you say invitation only. Well, I think those but, were his words, I don't know. But anybody who recommended somebody yes. um, oh, he it's was not happy hard, to include It's not hard them. to get invited, I yeah. understand that. Yeah. But, but, but I was just So you, you have to deal with numbers of people. You know, remember you're, when Tom was doing this for many years on his own, yes. he was personally got virtually no sleep for six plus months prior to one. Yeah. There were no staff members. Mm -hmm. um, so he had to 
figure out the dynamics of moving 300 people, where they would stay, how they would get to Atlanta, yes. et cetera. But I, I think it was, my observation was anyone who had attended and enjoyed it and had someone to suggest, to the extent that the numbers permitted, okay. uh, they were welcomed. Well, we know that uh, Tom did a lot of work and, and he also put a lot of his own resources into the success of G4G. Uh, did you also have an involvement of time? Were, was, uh, were you playing more roles behind the scenes than perhaps we realized? I think it was my idea that if I have a contribution that I have made, it was my idea that why should all these wonderful people be cooped up in a hotel for the entire thing? We had work, Tom and I worked for years on a skia style Japanese home with two and a half acres. I said, let's just invite everybody to come to our home. And thus the beginning of the then thinking through, well, look at these wonderful sculptors. Why don't we real time have some things being built uh, as part of the day at our home. And of course, so yes, I spent many hours working on food arrangements, etc. Well, we all appreciated your hospitality. I have to tell you that was the high point for us to go out there because we were not only with friends, but we were in a great environment with art being created around us and being very well-fed sushi and barbecue right. and wonder right. wonderful things. Well, and let me just say, a lot of attendees um, and their significant others would volunteer for kitchen duty. <laughs> we had that one crazy event where we actually prepared 300 lunches and 300 dinners in the kitchen <laughs> at the house. <laughs> it was not catered at all. <laughs> so, um, at any rate. So we had, you know, I want to move as much credit around as possible. It was a lot of volunteer help. And a people like Scott Hudson, I mean, finally there mm -hmm. in those last two or three gatherings, my goodness, Scott was always in our kitchen working with Tom, getting ready. Okay. Now, Tom has has his name on some papers and so forth, but he doesn't have the academic um, interest. He seems to have a more artistic or more appreciative interest in these matters. Uh, how, how did that happen, that he became, perhaps he has a mathematical interest that we're not aware of. It seems that he came to this from a completely different direction than a lot of the attendees. I don't know that you can describe somebody like Tom. He had a lot of interests. He had a lot of different collections. He had a very significant rare book collection over many, many years. Um, I think that if you look at Martin Gardner's background, mm -hmm. um, he's not easily labeled an academic. Yes, um, there are just people, I guess they used to be called Renaissance men or just people of many dimensions and interests. Have You've obviously met Martin on many occasions. Can you tell us any memories of Martin that might interest us or surprise us? We used to drive, of course, to Hendersonville where Martin and Charlotte had retired. Mm -hmm. And it, it was just wonderful to be with them. Uh, once again, no everyone was on the same basis and yeah. there were so many interests you could always find something of interest to talk about from your own life with Martin and Charlotte mm -hmm. and uh, Charlotte was certainly a pistol she was fun <laughs> to be around uh, somebody once, in, once tried to interview her and she refused uh, so we don't know as much about her as we might so tell us more about her obviously dedicated to Martin and just feisty and 
opinionated in a very charming way <laughs> with her own interesting collections. Tell us about For them. example, she had fascinating iron door stops in all these different designs and from Victorian times probably. Um, Perhaps the door stops were a defense mechanism to <laughs> the fact that Martin Gardner's book door collection. Door was always open. <laughs> and uh, so did you de um, develop a something like that, a defense mechanism to Tom's collecting bugs? Or did you? Uh... No, as I say, I have always been a curator at heart. Yes. And uh, at an earlier point in my life, I had two children and no child support. Yes. So um, I had to temporarily, for several decades, go into the corporate world to be mm -hmm. sure they could learn to read and write. Yes. Um, but uh, I don't know how to how else to. Put it. I just like beautiful aesthetic objects, be they three-dimensional puzzles of any size. Or uh, Tom and I, both of our mothers, were great collectors of sterling silver. Ah. So we had interesting patterns in common that we would use to entertain people. So you actually viewed the puzzles as puzzles, not just artistic things on the shelf. You, 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 you yourself played with the oh, puzzle. Oh, I, I was fascinated to, to learn how a puzzle is solved. It isn't that person X just magically can automatically do them. It's that they're interested enough to sit for whatever amount of time it takes to figure out how those pieces fit together. So I'm not particularly good at that, but I was always fascinated by the process and loved the puzzles. Now you had, as you mentioned, an uh, art background, a historian background or art? Yeah, I would have veered, had I, had I been able to have that as a career, I'd have been the curator. You know, I, was at, I went to school at Tulane in New Orleans mm -hmm. and loved the old houses and... Um, but, but now, in the past year or so, you have return to the art world. So it seems like you're returning to your first uh, well, isn't that aspirations. Happen, that's, I guess, what happens to many of us. We kind of come full circle. So, again, I'd just like you to say more about uh, what it's like to be back in the art world. Well, it's, it's the best way I know of to be around extremely interesting and likable people. And, uh, and I think math art, which I suppose some galleries and people would perhaps not accord the same status of pure art. Mm -hmm. To me, it's a natural blend. And so I think we can have a special aspect to our gallery. I'm not saying that's the only thing we'll do, but we'll certainly have it as an emphasis. Well, you've had an interesting background because I would guess 99% of people in America do not think math has anything to do with art. But you've been immersed in the intersection thereof. Well, when you think about Bach and the great musicians, be they the Beatles, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's poetry, but there's also the parsing, there's the mathematical, if you will, intervals that anyone with the expertise and interest can analyze those in classical Bach. And I, I picked Bach in particular because, as we know, M.C. Escher worked yes. to Bach. Yes. So as he was figuring out all of those spirals. And we have the great book, Good Escher and Bach, that helps us understand that relationship too right. by Hofstetter. The mathematicians that come here are a scruffy lot. Um, don't, probably many of them have never been in a Ritz-Carlton <laughs> before in their life. Um, has there been any friction over the years between this, um, this uh, scruffy lot and, uh, and the uh, beautiful aesthetic thing that you're trying to put together for us? 
Well, I think the only tension I've ever observed over the years has been Tom negotiating with the Ritz <laughs> to uh, make all this as possible as it could possibly be for people to stay here. Yes. Um, and that's probably part of, well, pick your word, curmudgeon, rebel of Thomas Mellon Rogers, Jr. <laughs> He probably enjoyed the irony of persons who care not about their personal opinion, um, appearance, because they've got more important things to do. That's right. So it's kind of a great image, isn't it? Yes. Uh, I, I go to uh, puzzle conferences, and uh, the same thing, we have to apologize to the hotel in advance that we're going to be take over their lobby. And, uh, and, and Well, I think by now the Ritz is used to it, accustomed. <laughs> So that even though their restaurant food managers change out, I think they, the new ones are given fair warning and instruction <laughs> by those departing. Fair enough. So I think it's been a, a great partnership over the years. Okay. Uh, have there been any um, people you've met through G4G that you know, kind of surprised you or became friends and closer to you than you might have guessed? I just, from the very beginning, instantly liked the, the people. Yeah. And, uh, you know, sure, uh, you know, people like Karen Farrell are probably very special friends, but there are many others. Um, now, I was generally at, the, at home getting ready okay. for the, the day event at the house, so mm -hmm. I didn't, I came to some of the talks and the dinners, but I pretty much had my hands full at home. Um, but I, I just generally like all the attendees. But there are no like magicians who became closer friends or mathematicians who became closer friends well, outside Leonard, of this group. Leonard Green and Mark Seta Ducati were extremely close friends of Tom's and so Leonard would stay at our house and Mark was in and out all the time so yes there were some special relationships among all the attendees. Uh, Leonard Green couldn't be here the last two times that's right. unfortunate but right. he's, he's always a um, humble but humble but uh, stellar person at the same time. It's always always a pleasure to meet him. Um, so is there anything about G4G that people don't know that you think that you know attendees don't appreciate? Well I've been intrigued now that I can have attained a rather voyeuristic uh, role in all of this to watch actual paid staff grappling with all of this. <laughs> And, uh, you know, as they say, how many people did it take to replace you? Well, in this case, quite a few. <laughs> so, you know, when you take someone of Tom's brilliance and his energy was just bottomless, yes. uh, and his interest and passion also, uh, you know, it was just pretty much, he was calling people all over the world 24-7 especially in those early years getting a critical mass, a nucleus that was disparate enough and coming from all countries. You know, you would have Russians, Chinese, Japanese, etc. I can say that uh, towards the end he called me and had very long conversations. At that point the, the thrust of the conversations was the ensuring the legacy of this conference, making sure that because he knew that he wasn't going to be able to continue. Uh, he was very concerned about making sure that it continued. Yes. And uh, uh, so I, I can say firsthand about, about, about his, his uh, intense interest in, 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 this, in the legacy of this. Well, and of course he, there at the end, really just out of sheer determination, lived long enough, even though he really couldn't receive people, but he did walk down that hall to the last board meeting. Mm -hmm. um, so, 
Tell us about what could only be described as a character in the story, and that's your house that you lived in at the time. Uh, because it was an extraordinary house in a neighborhood where you obviously stood out. No one, it was Japanese in design, Japanese in feel, uh, and it very gracious. Uh, it was very gracious design in the sense that we all felt at ease and transported to somewhere else. Uh, how did that house come to be? And Tom and I decided to buy a house together and it was very interesting. We were going to Japan at the time and as all of these organic episodes in one's life are, we ended up, I think on that trip, taking our mothers and we stayed in old Kyoto and a, a wonderful friend of Tom's who's become a lifelong friend of mine, John Reese, who is a extremely well-known um, tapestry weaver. He has pieces at the Metropolitan in New York. He's on the board of the National Textile Museum. Mm -hmm. um, John had heard that this um, California ranch slash Japanese style house was on the market and it turned out that um, one of the Coca-Cola executives who had spent time in Japan running Coca-Cola Enterprises there, he and his wife, when they decided to retire to Atlanta, brought a Japanese architect from California who designed the basic house. And of course it was built primarily with redwood, um, so Tom and I had looked at the house before we went to Japan, and it was my first trip to Japan. Mm -hmm. um, and I had always had an aesthetic interest in the Asian um, art, and of course, no less than Frank Lloyd Wright thought the great Japanese country homes were the finest examples of architecture. And so I had, of course, as all art-inclined people, I had long looked at uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's works and the Asian elements to them. So at any rate, by the time we left Japan, I told Tom, we're not going home unless we buy this house. And that, that began the journey. So we made many trips to Japan, we brought carpenters from Kyoto and we literally uh, found sources of cypress that were, it was at the time okay, people were bringing up the old timbers from the bottom of the Flint River mm -hmm. and we found a, a mill and had all of these things. So we, we literally took the basic structure and slowly but surely transformed it into skia style. Um, for example, the great, that's one tree that forms that secondary arch in the kitchen that was brought in in the old Japanese method and hand carved and curved on site. Um, so it was a wonderful adventure and then I got interested in the grounds because, of course, a successful Japanese house in olden times had as much water as it had square footage. Mm. And I wasn't quite able to accomplish that, but we did end up with um, the senior gardener from King Kakachu, the pavilion, had been a student with Takeo Usuji, who uh, retired teaching on the West Coast, great landscape architect, who has also recently died. So you had these two elderly schoolboy uh, in their 70s gardeners, and of course they do not 
so often build large ponds in Japan. So this was a great adventure uh, to Tamana-san. He had not been to the United States. So he came, Takeo was there. We built the, the huge pond and then of course started the maple cultivars. I think we had over 50 different types of maples um, that Takeo and I chose tree by tree and we somehow got it all planted. Uh, and Tom had this great idea that we were going to bring um, old bamboo trees in, which we did. We brought them up from South Georgia on a big flatbed truck and got them into the ground and they thrived. So what can I say? Indeed. Well, I'm glad you told us all that because we visited your house many times, but now we have a deeper appreciation of it and, and, and your involvement in making it into a very special place. And right. So. And of course, because of my corporate career, not only did I have resources, but I had enough Delta frequent flyer points to bring <laughs> all the workmen from Kyoto. <laughs> well, I'm sure we have to draw this to a close, so let's, I'd like to ask about what you're doing now, what, what your, uh, your years in corporate America were involved with hospital designs and things like that, but now you're getting back into that. Can you tell us a bit about that? Well, I, we have this uh, special project. We're doing a, um, a senior housing complex that I would like to live in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm able to, um, you know, pick all the colors and have a lot of features to it that I would find enjoyable. And, uh, and at the same time, I was, so that's a new model for me. I like to do new things, but using a lot of old skill sets and knowing how to put together management teams. I will not be running this one okay. as I used to run some of the hospitals that I built, but also simultaneously opening the art gallery and figuring out how to market for, for that gallery. So it's uh, a lot of new things and of course moving to Decatur I don't think people realized how close Tom was to Decatur. He not only was an Emory graduate, but he um, spent time on the campus throughout his life because of his rare book collection. And he also, as a young man, uh, lived in Decatur. I see. So somehow, I don't know that I was conscious of it, but I was happy to leave Buckhead, the mm -hmm. commercial side of town, and go to Decatur. Well, I can say I roamed around Decatur and I was surprised to see the large number of arts and craft homes in the area. Yes. It has a very different feel. Yes, and you know, there's life on the street when I open the front door and my grandfather was a Santa Fe engineer, so I get to hear the train as it <laughs> zooms by a couple of times a day. And uh, I can walk to all these great restaurants and so, it's a good thing, and Marta's right there, so you can get to the airport easily. Okay. Well, let me close by playing the role that everybody wants to play, and that is to thank you for your involvement in the continuing success of G4G. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been my great pleasure.